Good morning and welcome to this morning's Greenwood Street Devotional. If this is your first time, we hope you are very happy with joining with us to praise and thank God for another day. Let's just begin that day by coming to God and praying. Heavenly Father, we draw aside again into your presence, not through worth, but through Calvary. We come, Lord, because of what you have done for us, not for anything we have done for you because our hands are empty. But we come today because your Son has nail-pierced hands and nail-pierced feet. He won our redemption on that cross in Calvary, and we have the great privilege of being able to say, Abba, Father. We can say that to you, the Lord God Almighty, Jehovah, Yahweh. We come again, Lord, as this new day begins, and we thank you for the breath of life you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the hearts that are beating within us. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we have one with the other in Christ Jesus. Lord, we can look back to days in our lives when we were far from you. Days in our lives when we knew of you, but we did not know you. But then there came a time in each of our lives when you changed that, Lord. When you opened our eyes, you took hearts of stone, you turned them into hearts of flesh. When we could then say truly, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Lord, we come into your presence this morning through his name. We come, Lord, to listen to your word and to begin the day, hopefully, encouraged, blessed, maybe challenged, to be witnesses for you this day, wherever you have put us. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our reading this morning is found in John's Gospel. We're going to read from John chapter 12. I have spoken to you of earthly things. You do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's only begotten Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men have loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. I suppose for many people you might wonder at times, you know, where do you get the passage of scripture you're going to speak on? Well, for me, it's slightly different, I suppose, than Norman and the rest, because they can usually work through a passage, work through a, a theme, work through a whole idea. Mine tends to come in the mornings as I go out for my walk. It can come from a verse of scripture, it can come from a story out of the Bible, it can come from a hymn. And today's came as I sort of walked around over the last week or so. I couldn't get out of my head, you know, as we sing, For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And it kept coming back to me, time after time. And I thought, right, it's John 3.16. But the problem with John 3.16 is it has been done by so many experts. Practically every great preacher has spoken in John 3.16, some many, many, many times. Me, I'm looking at slightly, shall we say, looking at those who have done it before and thought, what can I say? What can I do that hasn't been done before and better? So this morning we're going to look at John 3.16. We're not even going to look at it all, just the first half. John 3.16 begins with, for God. He said, that's where salvation begins. Salvation doesn't begin at a mission hall. It doesn't begin with you. It doesn't begin with me. It begins with God, for God. It begins, I suppose, some people would say, well, maybe it begins with Abraham 
When Isaac says to him, we have the wood, we have the fire, where's the sacrifice? Abraham comes back and says, the Lord will supply the lamb. No, nope. it's before that. And then we look at the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve have sinned and they're hiding. And God comes in the cool of evening, as he usually does, and says, where are you? And then, because of their sin, he has to make a sacrifice and cover their nakedness. And then he says to him that he will have his heel bitten by the serpent, but the heel will crush the head of the serpent. Success over sin. What was before that? It's even before those first verses. In the beginning. Away out in the councils of eternity, long before anything's written, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I've got this great plan of creation. The plan of creating all things seen and not seen. But they equally know, being God, that man will fail miserably. They will make man perfect. They will make woman perfect. But they give them free will and that free will will allow them to follow God or to reject God. And they know that many, 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 in fact the whole of creation, will reject God. But they have a solution. If one who is sinless would be born on this earth, would take upon him the sins of these people who are going to be redeemed, then that would work. I like to think, and it's not scripture. You know the words that Isaiah said way over in Isaiah, where he did say, the Lord said, whom shall I send who will go for us? Isaiah said, here am I, send me. I can see that happening the first time, not through Isaiah, but in heaven. When they have the plan and God says, whom shall I send who will go for us? And the Lord Jesus can say, here am I, sent me. It was him who came to do the will of his Father. And then we come for God so loved. He loved this world. He loved his creation. He had made creation by the word of his mouth. He said it and it appeared. He said, let there be light and there was light. He said, let the waters separate between the earth. There were mountains, there were hills, there were land, there was sea, there were fishes, there were animals in the land. He creates all things, six days, everything is complete. Everything in this earth is there. It's needed by man. And then he makes man. And the big difference between the animals and man and rest that has been created is that man is made from the dust of the ground. And God breathes into him and creates man. And from man, he creates woman. It's interesting, you know, it's the word of God that creates all of creation. But it's the hands of God that make man. And God breathes into him. And the breath of God goes into that man. And that man becomes, as we say regularly, a living soul. There's now a soul inside man and a soul inside woman. Something the animals don't have. Something that is a difference between lost and saved. You can only save someone that's got a soul in them. And God has given us all a soul. A soul that can be lost, or a soul that can be saved. And God loved this creation. I don't know about you, but have you ever made something? And although it's not perfect, you love it. Many, many years ago, I used to make Airfix kits. And you mightn't have always got it right. But some of those Airfix kits, finished and painted and sitting on a shelf, followed me through 20, 30 years. I could never part with them. They weren't perfect, but I loved them. I think it's a bit like God. God looks at us and we're not perfect. He does love us. He loves us enough to do his best to save us. And then we find out he loves the world. And some people will say, well, that means everybody's going to get saved. It doesn't. He loves the world because when he looks at the world, I think he remembers the promise he made to Abraham. Abraham, from you I shall make of people like the stars of the sky for number. 
Abraham didn't have any children at that point. But God promised that the time would come when Abraham's family would number like the stars of the sky could not be numbered. I like to think when God looks down this world, he loves the world. Yes, he sees the vast number of sinners that are down here. But throughout all those sinners are the children of God. Men and women chosen in eternity. Men and women who Christ died for. Men and women who are going to leave this scene of time and spend eternity in the presence of their God. God can look at the world. He can love it. It's his creation. And the end result that's going to heaven is his work. And then we see why. For God so loved the world that he gave. God gave the most precious thing he had. He owned everything. Everything was his. He could have paid any price. But the price he paid was to send his son from his side and glory where he had been for all eternity to come to this earth, to be born of a woman, to live for 33 years among mankind. The last three years of his life, he was sinless as he was all his life. He preached, he taught. He did miracles. Everything about him proved he was who he said he was. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he's our saviour. God gave him to us. There was nothing more precious God could give. God gave his son for me and for you. Men, women, young people, boys and girls. If you're listening to this this morning and you know him. You know the Lord Jesus as your saviour. You know that all the faults, all the feelings, everything in your life that's a hindrance to salvation has been forgiven because of a cross and Calvary. Get down your knees and thank him. Praise him for who he is, praise him for what he has done. And for you dear people who maybe are listening this morning, and well, you know this man Jesus, yes, it'd be nice to be a Christian, but well, I don't... No, no, I'll do it in my own time. I'll do it when something else happens. I'll do it when I get a new suit. With all the reasons for not doing it, can I give you a reason for doing it? Take your eyes off all the things that you need to do before you come to faith. Take your eyes off this world. Put your eyes on a wooden cross outside Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. Look at a man hanging there, dying. And listen to what he says. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's you. He has asked the Father to forgive you. Take him at his word. Ask him in his heart. And then you will know. My God gave his Son to redeem you, to redeem me. And if you do that, then I'll see you in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. That's a word that encourages us. That's a word, Lord, that lifts us up before we begin a new day. That's a word, Lord, that takes the scales of our eyes and the hardness from our hearts. That's a word, Lord, that takes any feeling we have of being down, of maybe this coronavirus is getting through to us, maybe the lockdown and just the way things are happening and whether we still have jobs, whether things will work out right, whether with all the questions and all the wonders and everything else trying to struggle with. Yet, Lord, we come to you. We come to you and we really know that you love us, you care for us. And regardless of what happens down here, Lord, we're only here for a certain length of time. But where we're going is for all eternity. We're never going to be parted again. We're never going to be separated. When we meet our friends and our family up there, it's forever. We'll be in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. We'll be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. We have been in the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's no night up there. It's permanent daylight. Because the light comes from the throne of God. Lord, it's some place to look forward to. It's a place to be enthused and be encouraged about. Down here it mightn't be perfect. But like Abraham, Lord, we're only passing through. Just give us the patience. Give us the love for you. Give us the fortitude. Just to keep going to be your witnesses 
and through your witness that maybe you'll be pleased to bring some others into the kingdom to join with us in glory. For we ask it in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.